Hey, Pure Heart Online Campus, wherever in the world you live, we are so glad that you are joining us. You matter to us, you belong, and above all, you are loved. And if this is your first time joining us, head over to pureheart.org slash online connect. We want to get to know you. If you are a member or a regular attendee of Pure Heart, make sure you have the Pure Heart app downloaded on your smartphone so you can watch previous sermons and check out our Becoming Like Jesus podcast and access mobile giving. You can also give to the mission of Pure Heart through text to give or pureheart.org slash give. Your faithful giving is a key part of communities and lives continuing to be reached for Christ. Is God big enough? Is he big enough for our lives, for our challenges, our finances, our health, our marriages, our kids, the things that come up, the world? It's crazy, right? Is he big enough for those things? And we, if you've grown up in church, I have for, been in church a good chunk of my life. I would say, yes, God's big enough for sure. But then it comes down to moments that you go, is he big enough? We have been up in Alaska with the mission team for 10 days. Pastor Bob and I, we have, we're gonna go film up on the mountain. We're gonna talk about the bigness of God. It's gonna be an amazing sermon. And we schlepped all this gear up the mountain and we were overjoyed when it got done. We go, man, that was awesome. The glory of God, the bigness of God on display in this place. And we're heading home. And then suddenly there's a cloud of dust and commotion and things in front of us on the highway. What's, what is that? What, and we realize it's an accident. We pull over, it was right in front of us. And Bob and I get out and we start running over to the accident truck that's just absolutely smashed up and there's kids and they're screaming. We're trying to get the doors open. There's fluids falling out on the ground. The, the doors are not opening, they're jammed. Her legs at least broken. She thinks her arms broken too. She's kind of trapped. And the baby starts slipping in and out of consciousness and we're trying to stabilize them and, and, and get there. And where are the police? Are they coming? The ambulance, are they coming? And then Bob's there with her trying to comfort her as blood's coming down the face. What do I do? What do we do for these people and these children? And then I feel like this situation sort of carried, taking care of and Bob's with them. And I go over to the other car and we see a 16 year old young man that's halfway laying out of the vehicle. A great big dog that's been ejected from the car that's laying next to the car. And um, someone else is standing there and they're taking his pulse. And uh, they just shake their head. What do you do? At that moment, God, I need you. I need help. I need hope. How, I, I'm out of my league. I don't know what to do in this moment. And suddenly a father comes and I hear him going, is my son dead? Is my dog dead? And he's, he's running up and he's, we, he goes, I, help me, is, help me get him out of the car. We're like, sir, he's deceased. And he pulls him out. And he starts trying to do CPR on his son. And not to get too graphic, but he comes up with blood on his father with blood on his face. And he finally realized after trying, trying to do CPR, it's not, his son's gone. He realizes the dog is gone too. And I heard a wail come out of him that I've never heard in my life, a pain and agony, a scream that broke my heart. And the police have now arrived and they're trying, get this man back, get him out of here. He, he needs to be away from the scene. And this gentleman starts walking down the highway, crying and wailing. And I, what do I do? God, what do I do in this moment? Are you big enough for right now? Chase after him. I don't know where he's going. He's walking down the highway. I run up and I grab, I say, sir, I'm a pastor. Can I help you? Can I pray with you? And he grabs me and digs his face into my chest and just starts wailing and holding me. And we pray together. And I'm talking to him about his son that he's just lost. Talking to him about his dog, asking him his name. Just trying to spend time with him as he's broken. He's starting to call people on the phone, crying, saying, they're gone, they're gone, he's gone. Is God big enough? In those situations, we, we're pretty sure that we think God's big enough, but kind of like this, you see, it's fake. That we're living in a false reality, that we truly don't believe that. We maybe have put on a facade, a facade that says, yeah, God's big enough. But do we really believe it? Do we really believe in that moment? This, like this vehicle accident here, you see, do we believe in that moment? God, you can help in this place. You're good, you're big, you're powerful, you're all knowing. And that's the moments that challenge our faith. And so with that in mind, I wanna let you know that today we have a 
powerful message. And if you're God, if you just said the words, God's big enough, he's got everything under control, but maybe you haven't let it sink deep down into you, today's message is for you. There's a moment at the end of the message where Pastor Bob is gonna walk you through an element that I think is very, very powerful. That if this is maybe an area, we're not sure if you've let God be big enough in your life. If you're not sure even how to do that, how to let him be within you for those moments of, of challenges, then I think this is gonna bless you today. Welcome to church.
Hey, Pure Heart family, I'm off site this week, as you can see, in beautiful Alaska with one of our ministry teams. We've got a team of 22 folks working with a small church in Anchorage located in an underserved area of the city. And we've been doing some really incredible things together, uh, doing some much needed repair and remodel work on the church and parsonage, as well as working with kids in the neighborhood in some project areas, doing a summer day camp or a vacation Bible school. Uh, throughout the neighborhood. Yesterday, we went into an area that houses about 100 homeless families and individuals. We delivered sack lunches and water, we had a chance to pray with people who wanted to receive prayer. So being here in Alaska for the last several days, I mean, just surrounded by this absolutely beautiful place, like honestly being immersed in, in this extraordinary environment, I just can't help but think about how amazing and how big our God is. These are hard days for so many people, aren't they? I mean, we've got stuff like this crazy economy, inflation, the threat of recession, tragic shootings that are happening in cities all across our country, political rest. And I mean, the list kind of just goes on and on and on, doesn't it? So much happening all around us. I think it's easy for us, if we're not careful, just to feel really overwhelmed and discouraged and fearful. At least it is for me, certainly at times, when I look at all that stuff and I go, man, God, are you really big enough to handle all that's going on in the world around me? I mean, are you really big enough to handle even the stuff that I'm dealing with? I hope to be able to help you today take a look at how big God really is. Maybe for the first time in your life, consider that he's actually bigger than all the stuff going on around you and the stuff that's happening uh, in you as well. I really hope to encourage you. I hope maybe to introduce you to the reality that he's really big or maybe remind you of some things of how big he really is. So I got this question for you here from Alaska today, out here in this beautiful place. How big is your God? Is he bigger than your problems? Is he bigger than your disappointments? Is he bigger than your fears? Is he bigger than your failures? Is he bigger than those unanswered questions that you carry around with you maybe day after day, month after month? I think these are some times that we need to know. We need to know with certainty that our God is bigger than everything that's going on around us, in the world around us, or in our lives. I think it's really cool that when you open your Bible and you begin reading at the very beginning of the story, the very first thing you read in Genesis chapter one, verse one, is a reference to how big God is. I guess God just knew how much we would need to know how big he is in order to deal with all of the stuff of our life. And so in Genesis chapter one, verse one, the Bible says, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Now, a lot of us, we're familiar with that. We know those first lines and how the Bible and how the creation story opens. But what's really significant about this is this. The word for God in the original language of the Old Testament is the word Elohim. It's one of the first names given to God. It's a word for God that's found, a name for him that's found actually over 2,500 times in the Bible. It's like God is saying, hey folks, I want you to get this. I want you to know this about me. Name is a reference to character. It points to who God is. It's a descriptor of who he is. So Elohim, this name for God, in the very beginning, Genesis chapter one, verse one, El means mighty, strong, powerful. In the very beginning of the Bible, God establishes this truth that God is all powerful. I mean, think about it. One of the first things that he wants you to know is this. He can handle it. He wants you to know that he's got it. He wants you to know he's got you. He's got all of it. Everything you can't handle, everything you don't have the power for, friend, he does. Theologians refer to this aspect of God's character as his om omnipotence. Omni meaning all, all potent, all powerful. God is infinitely powerful. That's what he wants us to know about him today. His unlimited in power. It includes things like his capacity, his ability, what he's able to do in your life and through your life. It includes his authority and all of his strength. It is this truth, friends, that he absolutely is all 
powerful. He's big and his bigness includes his incredible power. God said to the prophet Jeremiah, I am the Lord, the God of all the peoples of the world. Then he asked this question, is there anything that's too hard for me? Think about that. Maybe he would ask you that today. Is there anything that's too hard for me? Now I want you to see just a couple things about his power and what that might look like in your life. Just two quick things. Number one, God has the power to create anything from nothing. Now why is that a big deal? It's a big deal because it means that you can stop trying to make everything happen. I don't know about you, but sometimes I work myself to death trying to figure things out, trying to orchestrate things, trying to move things, trying to make things happen. And God says, Bob, you don't have to do that. I have the power to make things happen. Isn't it true that we like to think that we can make most things in life happen? I remember when I was younger, I used to hear this saying all the time. If it's to be, it's, yeah, go ahead and say it, up to me. If it's to be, it's up to me. And the truth is, I think that we're more limited in power than we might like to actually admit. Because really, you don't have the power to do a whole lot of things in life. You don't have the power to change someone. You can't even change yourself at times. That's why we, one of the reasons that we need God so desperately. There are things in our lives that we can't change. They're beyond our power to change. But he has the power to make those changes in us. You don't have the power to make someone love you, do you? That can be a frustration that we sometimes have for a long time. We try to believe that we can actually make someone love us. You don't have that power, you don't have that ability. You don't have the power to control your today and the circumstances that you're faced with today. You certainly don't have the power to do anything about controlling your tomorrow. I think all of us would probably do really well to take the first steps that every addict in recovery has been told that they have to take as a part of their recovery journey. It's simply this, to admit that I am powerless. I'm absolutely powerless. And I can admit my powerlessness because then I can accept and receive his unlimited power. Listen to this verse. This is a verse out of Psalm chapter 33, verses six to 10. The writer of the Psalm says, the Lord merely spoke and the heavens were created. He breathed the world and all the stars were born. He gave the sea its boundaries and locked the oceans in vast reservoirs. Let everyone in the world stand in awe of him. For when he spoke, the world began. It appeared at his command. Wow. He has the power to create something out of absolutely nothing. I'm standing here as evidence of that. God created all of this. And there was a time when none of this existed. And so I stand here today as just this reminder where God is like saying, Bob, just soak this in. Like take all this in and be reminded all the things in your life that aren't even yet in existence, I have the power to bring that beauty into existence. I have the power to bring all of that into existence, into your life. Several trips ago on our way up to the Navajo Nation and We've made eight or nine trips up there with amazing teams from our Pure Heart family to go up and serve our brothers and sisters on the Navajo Nation. And we have this tradition. Usually we like to, on our way to Holbrook, where we turn and go north, we go through Winslow. And we just can't help but stop. Standing on a corner in Winslow, Arizona, such a fine sight to see. It's a girl, my Lord. Uh, You know, you know, you know the song. Anyway, so we're standing, we're gathering together on this corner in Winslow, Arizona. It's like 5.15, 5.30 in the morning. And the sunrise that's coming up is absolutely extraordinary. I can't even describe it to you. I mean, the the colors were so amazing, beautiful. They filled the morning sky. It was, it actually left me speechless. I know you find that hard hard to imagine, but it left me speechless. It was just so beautiful. All I could do was really soak it in. It was incredible. So we're standing with the team. We're getting ready to sing the song. And I'm like, hey, friends, I want to pause for just a second. I just, how many of you, did did you guys catch that sunrise today? Did you catch that just a few minutes ago? Did you catch the beauty of it? The splendor of it? I mean, who do you think did that? You didn't. You're good, but you're not that good. But let me tell you who is that good. God is that good. And I told him, it's just like this morning, God reminding us by bringing that beautiful sun up and filling the sky with all of that beauty. It's like 
he was reminding us, hey guys, hey Bob, I want you to see this. I got you today. I got you. I'm, po I'm powerful, more powerful than you could ever imagine, more powerful than you can ever know. And as you take a look at that sun and as you realize you can't do any of that, I want you to know I can, I did it all, and I've got you today. I think it's important that we understand this. If you're familiar with Job's story, for instance, in the Old Testament, we're introduced to Job in the first couple of chapters of that book. And then by the time you get to chapter three, we realize that Job's life is kind of unwinding. It's actually unraveling. And there's a lot of devastation that's happening in Job's life. And from Job chapter three on for about the next 20 chapters, Job just goes off making these complaints against God. In fact, there are at least three different times where in three different chapters, the chapter opens with these, word, with these words. Job continued his discourse. He's just going off on God. And what's incredible is that God just lets him go on and on and on. And then in chapter 38, it's God's turn. Chapters 38 to 41, God speaks to Job about who he is. It's almost as if God says to Job, Job, are you finished? Are you done? Now let me tell you some things about who I am that you're not seeing. I could almost imagine the dialogue kind of going like this. Job, son, come here. Come here, Job. Job, I want you to look up into the heavens. Tell me what you see, Job. What do you see? And Job's saying, well, God, I, I see stars. Well, that's right, Job. That's good. You do see stars. Now, Job, tell me how many stars do you see? Wow. Well, I, I don't know, God. I, I can't count them. That's right, Job. That's right. You can't, but I can because I made every one of them. I hung every one of those stars in the sky. And then, then he says to Job, Job, I want you to look down. I can just imagine this, Job, look down. What do you see now, Job? Well, I, well God, I, I see sand, I, I see granules of sand. That's right, Job. And how many granules of sand do you see? Well, God, I, I don't know, I, I can't count how many granules of sand there are. And God reassures Job and says, that's right, son, you can. You don't know how many granules of sand there are, but Job, I know how many there are. I put them all in place. Then in chapter 42, 42 through all of this dialogue with Job, he realizes that he's been wrong in his understanding of who God is. And the Bible says that he repents. Listen to what Job says as we close out that 42nd chapter of Job. Job says to God, Sur surely I spoke of the things I did not understand, things too wonderful for me to know. My ears had heard of you, but now my eyes have seen you. It's important, friends, that we understand really how big God really is, but not just that we know it with our eyes, that we know it with our heart. And it's things like we see in creation, like I'm in today, that help us with that. The second thing about God, the aspect of God's power that I really love for you to see, is that God has the power to sustain everything that he's created. What does that mean? That's good news because it means that you can let go of all the stuff that you've been hanging on to. I'd like you to do something with me just real quick. I'd like you to take your hands. I'd like you to hold them out in front of you. And as you do that, I'd like you just to clench your fists. And I want you to imagine yourself holding on to something that you in fact have been holding on to. <clears throat> something you've been trying to figure out, something you've been trying to solve, something you've been trying to control, a situation or a person, something that you've been afraid of and you've been holding on to. You can't figure it out. What are you holding on to? Now here's what I want you to do. I want you just to open your hands and turn them over and let it go. And as you do that, repeat this. God is God and I'm not. God is God and I'm not. So the Bible says in Isaiah chapter 40, verses 28 to 29, don't you know by now that the everlasting God, the creator of the farthest parts of the earth, never grows faint or weary. Listen to this. He gives, you, he gives power to the tired and worn out and strength to the weak. Friends, that's really good news. The second thing I'd really like for you to see is that God is all knowing. He's big, in his bigness. Not only is he all powerful, but he's all knowing. The psalmist says in Psalm 147, five, how great is our Lord. His power is absolute. His understanding is beyond 
comprehension. See, God knows all there is to know. He knows everything. Theologians refer to this as his omniscience or simply his all-knowing. For God, there are no mysteries. Listen, he's never confused. He's never perplexed. He's never caught off guard. Nothing is hidden from him. There are some things that you'll never hear God say. Things that you'll never hear him say like, uh-oh, oh no. Hmm? We know that God knows everything, but listen. I mean, I think we know that God knows everything, right? My question is, do we live like we know and believe it? Or are there times when we don't really quite act like that? You know, because maybe, maybe God's given us some direction to go do something and we choose not to do it. Maybe God tells us to stay away from something and we go ahead and do the things that he's told us not to do. These are examples of just not really trusting in the fact that God knows more than I do. When you decide to do something your way instead of what you know is his way, you're saying, God, I think I know more than you do. When he leads you in one direction and you choose to take another direction, what you're really saying is, God, I think I know what's best for me. I know better what's best than you do. God knows all about you in his omniscience, his all-knowing. He knows everything there is to know about you. And that's not a bad thing. David said in Psalm 139, Lord, you've searched me and you know me. It's interesting that the word that David uses in the original Hebrew language, the word for know that's used here is actually, it's the word yada in the original language of the Old Testament. Yada is more than just knowing information. It's not like God just knows things about you. Yada is to know someone in complete detail. It's like to know you in the depth of your being. It's to know someone with a certainty about them. It's a complete and thorough understanding of that person. God knows you in complete, thorough detail with certainty. Listen, he understands you and he still loves you. This word yada, it's an amazing word. It also, it it's also speaks of like covenant language, meaning it, it means that he is completely faithful to you. So he knows everything about you and he is still completely faithful to you. So you could put these definitions together this way. David is saying, you've searched me and you know me, you yada me. God, you know every detail of my life. You know me to the depths of my being. Nothing is hidden from you. You know me with certainty. You completely understand me and you're still committed and faithful and beautiful to me. Isn't that incredible? It's extraordinary. Dr. Richard Swenson, he describes how complex we humans are in the research that he's done of the DNA sequence of the human genome. The genome is the complete set of genetic information for humans. You could say it this way. It's how you are put together genetically. And according to Dr. Swenson, if you were to try and compile the human genome into 2,000 page books, it would require 200 volumes to hold it all. That's how complicated you really are. If you were to read a person's genome sequence, Dr. Swenson says, out loud without stopping at normal reading speed, 24 seven, it would take you nine and a half years to complete your reading. He goes on to say, if, you're, if you were to read it just 40 hours a week, it would take you 132 years to read through it. Listen, friends, you are a complex, complicated creature but God knows you intimately. He knows all about those complexities. He knows all about you. He knows you completely and thoroughly, every detail. You know what that means? That means that he knows all you need. He knows everything that you need today, everything that you stand in need of, he already knows it. And it also means he knows all that you can handle. He knows the amount of pressure. He knows the amount of difficulty. He knows everything that you can handle and he promises to be right there with you and give you what you need. Because even with everything that you need, the Bible says he has the ability to meet every single one of those needs. So we see that God is big, like really big. He's all powerful, he's all knowing. And then I want you to catch this lastly. Your God, the Bible says, is always present with you. It's true that he doesn't just watch over you. Listen, he's with you. Theologians say that God is omnipresent. Omni meaning all or always. 
always, always, always present. In the midst of every difficulty, every challenge, every disappointment, every moment, God is right there with you. Again, not just watching over you from distance. He's right there with you side by side. Like actually, if you're a follower of Jesus, the Bible says, like actually so close that he lives inside of you. Listen to this verse right here. This verse is out of Jeremiah 23, verses 23 to 24. God says, I am a God who's everywhere, not in one place only. No one can hide where I cannot see them. Do you not know that I am everywhere in heaven and on earth? There's never a place that God just isn't. And that means that he is always with you. One of the most common words used in the original language of the Old Testament to describe God's presence is actually the word panim. It means face or literally, watch this, listen to this in the face of, or watch, to be before the face of. Let me tell you what that means. We think of the phrase in your face as something that's really pretty negative and kind of threatening, but the biblical idea of panim, this face in your face kind of presence, it's not threatening at all. It's not a negative bad thing. It's actually a very beautiful and very powerful thing because it represents, it speaks of a close personal encounter with a person. Think of that, God, think of God, that kind of closeness, that kind of tenderness, that kind of intimacy, that kind of connection, that face to face kind of connection that God wants to have with you. That's a beautiful closeness, friends. God is not out there in the cosmos somewhere distant. You don't have to chase after him. You don't have to look for him. You don't have to find him. He is right here with you in this moment, face to face. It's the same word that David used in Psalm 67, verse one, when he writes, may God be gracious to us and bless us and may he make his face shine upon us. So this is the extraordinary thing to me, my friends. The reality that God is big, like he's really, really big. And here I stand in Alaska surrounded by these incredible, these enormous mountains, the beauty, the bigness of this place that reminds me of how big and beautiful he is. But what really is extraordinary to me, what really captures my imagination and actually captures my heart is this reality. That God is big, but he's not too big meaning he's not too big to get up close and personal like we were talking about in a minute, just a minute ago. Let me give you an illustration of that. In the beginning, God's people, they had a name for God, but it was a name that could never be spoken. And this unspeakable name for God is the word that we pronounce as Yahweh, Yahweh. When Hebrew is written, you only write the consonants. You fill it in with vowels. They aren't written, and a person who knows Hebrew knows what vowels to fill in and knows when to fill them in. In the spelling of the name of God, that is the sacred name of God, as they called it, as they referred to it, there are three different consonants that are used. Listen, these are the only consonants that don't allow you to close your lips. When spoken, they actually perfectly replicate the sound of inhalation and exhalation. Your lips don't touch. You replicate the sound of inhalation, taking a breath in and letting a breath out. Like this. Notice my lips, they don't even move. That's how close God is. He's in your very breath. God is as available and accessible as the air you breathe. That's how close he is. In those times when you don't know what to say to him, you don't have a prayer, you're so distraught, you're so anxious, you're so frustrated, maybe confused, and you don't even know how to pray, really maybe God is just saying, hey, sit here and breathe, because when you're taking a breath, you're actually saying my name. You're speaking my name. You're breathing him in, and you're breathing him out. He's as available and as close as the air that is inside and outside your lungs. He's always happening, always available, always accessible. You know, every day it's estimated you and I take about 2,500 breaths. 
You take a breath about every three to five seconds. Even when you're asleep, you do this. You say his name. You worship him. Your soul experiences his closeness. If you think about it, it's the first thing you did when you entered this world. And it'll be the last thing that you do when you leave this earth. I want you just to bow your heads with me for a moment. Bow your heads and take those breaths with me for a few minutes. Experience his closeness, the beauty and the power of his presence in your life. He really is that close, that beautiful and that powerful for you today. And you think about how little it really has to do with you today, my friends. You're just sitting there breathing. You don't even need your lips. Isn't that extraordinary? He really doesn't need that much from you. He just kind of needs your yes. He needs your willingness. He just asks for you to recognize that he's there and close. And he really will prove himself to be big and powerful and beautiful, present and all knowing in your life. As you do that, think of his power. Think of his presence. Think of his all knowing, everything he knows about you, your life, and the situation you face today. Let him bring his peace and his comfort, his power and his bigness to your life today. God, I pray for my friends who are listening and watching this today. And Lord, um, may their souls just really be lifted up and encouraged by these powerful, beautiful, but very simple truths today that you really are so big. You're so much bigger than our lives. You're so much bigger than the world around us, the chaos around us. You're so much bigger than our unanswered questions. You're so much bigger than our problems and our challenges. You're bigger than the economy. You're bigger than inflation. You're bigger than the threat of recession. You're bigger than all of those things, yet you're so big, but you're not too big to be so close to us. So in these moments, God, when we breathe you in and breathe you out, may you do what only you can do, the ministry of your Holy Spirit, Spirit bringing comfort, bringing peace, bringing hope, and bringing strength. I pray these things in Jesus' name, amen. I was so honored to be able to be there with Bob as we celebrated the glory of God, the bigness of God in a place like this. And we talked about the bigness of God, we talked about also how he can be also small enough to be right with you, with me. And maybe, like Bob talked about, you've had a time of doing it on your own and going your own way. And you've never made the choice to accept Christ into your life. But you recognize you need a big God to come into your experience and make a difference in your life. If that's you right now, would you pray this with me in your heart? Dear Heavenly Father, God, I recognize the need for your bigness in my life. My sins are big on their own. My struggles are big on their own, God. And I need someone that's much bigger than myself to bring a change and difference in my life. So I pray that right now you're going to come into my life, forgive my sins. God, let you be the one that takes control of my life because I can't do it. I'm not big enough, but we know that you are and we know that you're good. We thank you for this all in Jesus' name. Amen. If you prayed that prayer with us today, we would love to get in touch with you. We'd love to help you with some next steps. Go ahead and go to pureheart.org slash online connect. Go ahead and fill out that form to let us know you prayed that prayer today. And let's take a look at some of the things else that we've been doing up here in Alaska. So exciting. Check this out. 
Pure Heart is constantly looking for opportunities to link arms with other churches, partner with other ministries, and when the body of Christ is unified, God uses His church to do amazing, amazing things. And over the last couple weeks, we had the opportunity to come alongside Sunrise Community Church in Anchorage, Alaska. This church is situated in an underserved neighborhood that's home to low-income families, immigrants from all over the world, and native Alaskans. We brought up a team of 23 people to help paint areas inside the church, paint the parsonage, repair and upgrade bathrooms, beautify landscaping on campus. We had a kids' vacation Bible school for the local children. Many of these kids, they face very challenging lives. One little boy had bandages from where he'd been recently hit by a bullet when his mother had been shot. He also showed us a scar on his leg where he'd been stabbed by his father. So these children, we spent time with them, eating snacks, doing crafts, playing games, talking to them about Bible stories. We want them to know, these children who face difficult circumstances every day, that they're loved by God and loved by us. We also heard about some homeless encampments nearby. The local homeless shelter closed down at the beginning of COVID. They camp not far from the church in woods that are full of mosquitoes and bears wandering in close proximity. They're raising their families in these areas. So we went into their encampments. We gave them a sack lunch meal, asked if we could pray for them. We want these often overlooked individuals to know that they're seen and loved. What a powerful trip. Our team left with full hearts, knowing that God worked through us to revitalize a church building, share the love of Christ with children, bless homeless families, impact a struggling community with the presence and the kingdom of God, letting them know they're seen and they are loved. Thank you for your faithfulness, allowing us to minister to people in these situations. Would you pray with me? Heavenly Father, God, we thank you for the ability to come up here and join arms with the church, God, in a challenging community, an underserved community, God, where we can come and love this neighborhood, love native Alaskans, love people from all over the world that are living in this neighborhood, God. We pray that you would continue to allow us to see those who feel unloved, see those who have been forgotten, God, and pour your love into them, Heavenly Father. We thank you, God, for each and every person giving you to the mission and vision of your heart, God. Let us be wise with how we continue to pour those funds out so that we can see those who you love and care about, God, and do things for the sake of others. In Jesus' name, amen.